the Renaissance was interwoven with four fundamental threads, naturalism, idealism, humanism, and individualism. Indeed, the Renaissance demands four parallel histories. I'm going to take them in turn now. In order to understand the extent to which the Renaissance was also a return to naturalism, we have to go back to 1204. Now, in the last class, we considered how the sack of Constantinople removed some of the most fundamental and precious objects from Byzantine history. But it also created an exodus of artists from Constantinople across Europe. And a number of artists settled in Italy. This is not Constantinople. This is the ceiling of the baptistry in Florence. And Coppo di Marcavaldo, who's believed to have mosaiced the ceiling of the baptistry and to have painted this crucifix, is an artist who is clearly working within the Byzantine tradition. His figure of Christ is flat frontal, rather floating. And if we look at the anatomy, each body part seems to be distinguished from one another. Anatomical accuracy is sacrificed for an expressive depiction of Christ himself. So it's important to remember that Florence, before it was a Renaissance hub, was imbued with a Byzantine spirit. However, one Florentine artist more than any other arguably changed the history of the Renaissance by returning to a more naturalistic approach to the human body, to the world around him. That was Giotto. And a comparison of Giotto's crucifixion just later than Coppo's reveals that Giotto was preoccupied with the notion of Christ as a human being inhabiting real space. Giotto's Christ sags on the cross. There's an action of gravity pulling him down and his anatomies are more accurate. Individual muscles are not distinguished, but unified under a second skin. Despite his greenish tinge, which is the Vedaccio underlayer over which artists would model up the human body in egg tempera, we can see that Giotto has taken a fundamentally different approach to Coppo. But not only does Giotto's crucifixion signify a more naturalistic approach to the human body, it also to some extent shows a more humane understanding of the Christian stories. And it appealed to a population who needed empathy at a time of repeating plagues throughout Europe. Giotto's famous lamentation from the Arena Chapel in Padua emphasizes a heightened emotionalism and an attempt to use dramatic devices to heighten the human nature of the scene. Here you can see figures with their back to the viewer, framing the titular characters of Christ and his mother and in intensifying their human exchange. From the angels at the top to the monumental draped figures at the bottom, Every individual expresses a slightly different personal reaction, different gestures that heighten and intensify their own humanity. This is heaven on earth, but expressed in a more human way. In the words of Vasari, Giotto became so good an imitator of nature that he banished completely the Byzantine manner and revived the modern and good art of painting introducing living people, which had not been used for more than 200 years. Now, in spite of Vasari's inherent bias towards Florentine artists, it's fair to say that Giotto did mark a change in approach. And the fact that he used this naturalistic method so consistently defined the generation of artists to come. Yet he wasn't the only one. And as you've come to expect from the language of art history, there is another parallel story here. Around about the same time, another Roman artist, Pietro Cavallini, was working on his own last judgment, this time in the church of Santa Cecilia in Trastevere, 
in Rome. And this fresco helps to explain why this return to naturalism had come about. As early Christian frescoes suffered from the passage of time, they were repainted. When Cavallini was commissioned to do this, he tried to maintain the late classical qualities, rounded, weighty figures enveloped by softly folding draperies, modeled by light and standing in an illusionistic space. The point Frederick Hart is making here is that it was because Cavallini knew how Roman frescoes were painted and was responsible for repainting them that created the conditions and created the logic for a new humanized approach to Christian figures. This is a Roman fresco from the first century, now in the Met Museum in New York. And it shows that Roman painters were preoccupied with creating the illusion of accurate space on a flat surface, a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Leon Battista Alberti was responsible for codifying what's called linear perspective in his book De Pictura on painting. Now, De Pictura is a crucial text because it was first published in Latin and therefore designed for a high-end elite patron. Alberti was a Florentine who also was an assistant to the Pope. So he is an example of a scholar, but nevertheless, someone preoccupied with the art of the painter. And it's important to remember that De Pictura was subsequently translated into De la Pittura, a book designed for artists themselves. Alberti was developing a practical guide as to how to create the illusion of three dimensions on a 2D plane. And Alberti's text set out the ways in which painters could create an ideal historia. An historia is a history painting. It might be a religious scene, a mythological scene, or even a history. But for Alberti, there were rules that artists needed to adhere to in order to achieve the ideal image. For example, Alberti demanded that figures be placed convincingly in space. If they are in the foreground, they're larger, in the middle ground, slightly smaller. But he's also responsible in his text for saying that we shouldn't use gilding anymore, but we should create the illusion of gold in yellow paint. Indeed, he limits the number of figures that painters should include in a given historia, nine or 10 and no more. So Alberti codified the system that artists of the Renaissance before him had been developing in order to elevate the status of painters from their previous incarnation as medieval craftsmen to a newly learned liberal artist. But Alberti's tiled pavement, as it's known, also created a history of kitchens. Small kitchen, big kitchen, strange flagellation kitchen. But the Renaissance was not just a story of naturalism. It was also an attempt to synthesize a more realistic approach to the world with the ideals of classical antiquity. And it was that ideal spirit that artists and architects of the Renaissance tried to recapture in their own structures and works. After losing out to Ghiberti, you may have thought that Filippo Brunelleschi was now out of the Renaissance conversation. Well, in 1420, he and his old rival were jointly tasked with completing the Dome of Florence Cathedral, which required spanning 42 meters across at a height of 55 meters above ground. Now, Ghiberti retired in 1432 after designing the elaborate marble revetments. But with Brunelleschi designated inventor and governor, there was only room for one sheriff in town. But what were the fundamental problems facing Brunelleschi? Well, on the one hand, he had to span a diameter too large for traditional wooden centering, which had been used to construct Gothic cathedrals. At the same time, the drum of the dome had already been constructed without external buttressing, meaning that any weight resting on it must exert the absolute minimum of side thrust. Now, the solutions that Brunelleschi developed to solve these problems were manifold 
And there isn't the time here to go into the detail that we need to to appreciate the man. But the crucial point to be made here is that without the classical prototypes, without Brunelleschi's own personal experience of the Basilica of Constantine, of the Pantheon, and of the Roman monuments, he wouldn't have been able to achieve new solutions. Indeed, the ingenious herringbone brickwork that he used to lighten the structure as it ascended depended on antique precedent. But if we look at Brunelleschi's end result, we can still see it has a lot to do with the old formula of Gothic pointed arches, of ribbed vaults. And it wasn't as ideal, it wasn't as hemispherical as Brunelleschi had intended. And it wasn't until the Medici family offered him the commission for a new dome structure that he was able to realize the kind of platonic perfection that he'd sought to achieve in the dome. For Brunelleschi, Vitruvian principles defined his architectural system. Brunelleschi caps what is a fundamentally Christian structure with the ultimate statement of pantheon-like Platonism. According to Vitruvius, without symmetry and proportion, no temple can have a regular plan worked out after the fashion of the members of a well-shaped body. What this tells us is that it wasn't only Giotto whose approach to naturalism was defined by a more human understanding of emotion and individual expression, but the way buildings were built were once again defined by the ideal proportions associated with the human body. This passage from Palladio's Four Books of Architecture from the 16th century reminds us that the circle was reconciled by Renaissance architects with the Christian God. This plan in which you can see the old sacristy in the top left and the Basilica of San Lorenzo to which it was attached next door reveals how Vitruvian Brunelleschi's approach was. Remember, for Vitruvius, proportion consists in taking a fixed module, both for the parts of the building and for the whole. Here you can see that Brunelleschi's plan is defined by the dimensions at the crossing, where the nave crosses the transept. And that square defines the proportions of the bays within the nave, which are half the size of that crossing square. So unity between the parts within a harmonious whole defined Brunelleschi's approach and it defined architecture of the Renaissance after it. Yet idealism was not limited to the sphere of architecture. Masaccio's tribute money in the Brancacci Chapel in Florence synthesizes idealism with naturalism in order to create the ultimate Christian painting. This is the kind of history painting on which Alberti's treatise was based. We see linear perspective, orthogonal lines converging at the most important figure, Christ. We also see aerial perspective, the fading out of the landscape with blue. But also we see the ideal forms in the architecture. We see the apostles dressed as classical philosophers. So wherever you look here, there's the union of idealism and naturalism, and this defined painting that came after. Here we can see the extent to which both Donatello and Michelangelo were likely influenced by the precedent of Nicola Pisano. But this comparison also distinguishes the different strategies of each artist, as well as the difference between the early and high Renaissance. In Donatello's version, he shows David triumphant over the severed head of the Philistine giant Goliath. It's an expression of jaunty victory. And you can see the classical contraposto, but you can also see that this is a boy holding Goliath's own sword. By contrast, Michelangelo elevates David to the status of a colossus. At 18 feet tall, he's three times life size. And Michelangelo shows him not after victory, but before, as he's just viewed the giant on the horizon. 
Michelangelo frames David's triumph as an intellectual one. This is a triumph over his fear. And it's worth us taking a closer look at David, because to a great extent, he assimilates the threads of the Renaissance into their purest form. We see the ideal of a classical demigod joined to the divine spirit of a Christian one. We also see the uncanny naturalism through which Michelangelo has captured the veins, the muscles and the skeletal system unified all in one. And he still maintains the appearance of a gangly adolescent at the same time as his physique is clearly imperious. His left arm, borne back and supported on the sling, reflects the low tensile nature of the material. Likewise, David's right hand is still attached to the core. These were solutions fundamentally forced by circumstance, by the dimensions of a narrow block. But they also reflect Michelangelo's attempt and high Renaissance artists' preoccupation with trumping their early Renaissance predecessors. And in his figure of David, Michelangelo achieves the ultimate union of classical idealism and naturalism. And this relied in part on his dissection of corpses in the morgue of Santo Spirito, as much as on his early development and his early life in the Medici sculpture garden of Lorenzo the Magnificent. To a great extent, Michelangelo is a product of the Renaissance, as well as someone who defined its next stage, its final stand. The sculpture was originally commissioned by the Wool Merchants Guild, who were responsible for Florence Cathedral. Yet once the citizenry became aware of the image that Michelangelo created, he was dragged from the Duomo to the Piazza della Signoria, hoisted up as a statement of moderate Republican values. And his pivotal position facing Rome was a statement of Florence as an underdog, but nonetheless one capable of triumphing over outsiders. So the commission for the David went from being a fundamentally Christian one to being a fundamentally political one. And it's no coincidence that the Gonfaloniere, the prime minister of Florence at the time, Piero Soderini, chose the day of David's unveiling to be invested with his political title. But of course, a David who looks like a demigod couldn't have come to exist without humanism, without the study of classical texts. Indeed, as we've already discussed, the Medici family were responsible for drawing together some of the foundational classical texts surviving from antiquity. This painting by Piero della Francesca reveals another story that needs to be told. On the left-hand side, you can see the figure of the Byzantine emperor, John VIII Palaeologus, appropriately named Old Word. In 1439, John Old Word was invited by Cosimo de' Medici, who'd convened the Council of Florence. And the Western and Eastern churches met in Florence in an attempt to unify the church in order to ward off invasion by the Ottoman Turks. Famously, the Byzantine delegation brought the complete works of Plato, as well as a willingness to teach it to the court of the Medici. This created and initiated Cosimo de' Medici's Platonic Academy, his library. But it was also the actions of men like Manuel Chrysoloros, the intellectual who actually passed the information from Byzantium to the West that defined the Renaissance spirit of humanism. Because the Renaissance was not just an artistic phenomenon, it also reflected the transfer of antique information from one historical center to another. And another member of the Byzantine delegation, Cardinal Bessarion, famously gifted his entire library to Venice at the same time. So the Council of Florence was a defining moment in the transfer of this information from east to west and from an old word to a new world order. Marsilio Ficino was the leading scholar at the Medici Academy under Lorenzo the Magnificent. 
And this passage encapsulates the extent to which the Renaissance represented a rebirth of all aspects of culture in Florence. If we are to call any age golden, it is beyond doubt that age which brings forth golden talents in different places. That such is true of this, our age, no one will hardly doubt. For this century, like a golden age, has restored to light the liberal arts, which were almost extinct. Grammar, poetry, rhetoric, painting, sculpture, architecture, music, and all this in Florence. This century appears to have perfected astronomy. In Florence, it has recalled the Platonic teaching from darkness into light. And in Germany, there have been invented the instruments for printing books. Ficino is positioning Florence at the center of a cultural revival. And the fact that he is elevating painting, sculpture, and architecture to the level of the classical liberal arts reinforces the newfound status of the arts in the Renaissance. But there were other elements in Renaissance Florence who sought to reject this new learning, this humanistic thinking, and replace it with the old medieval mindset. Savonarola came to the fore after the Medici had been expelled in 1492. He was the leading figure of the Dominican order of mendicant friars, based at Santa Maria Novella. And in 1497, he organized a famous bonfire of the vanities, books, luxuries, all those elements that the Medici and the intellectual climate of Florence had sought to valorize were rejected. And it chimed with the fear of the end of the world that coincided with 1500. Yet it wasn't long before Savonarola was burnt at the stake. The Florentines obviously missed their luxury lifestyle, as well as the education and learning that went with it. But Florence wasn't the only center for learning. Indeed, after the end of the Western Schism in 1417, the papacy returned from Avignon to Rome. Pope Nicholas V established the Vatican Library, replete with classical texts. Raphael's image of philosophy from the High Renaissance occupies a special place within the Stanza della Segnatura. These were the Vatican apartments. Just as Michelangelo's David had represented the ultimate union of idealism and realism in sculpture, Raphael's School of Athens represents the ultimate statement of the High Renaissance in Rome. Indeed, in 1495, Raphael's father, Giovanni Santi, who was painter to the court of Urbino, enumerated a number of key considerations for the High Renaissance artist. On the screen, you can see how Raphael assimilated the different requirements laid out by his father within his composition of the School of Athens. It's carefully planned and hence fulfills the requirement for drawing. But it's also a clever invention set within an imagined antique setting based on a combination of a Roman triumphal arch and the Basilica of Constantine. Indeed, Raphael here is paying tribute to his friend, the architect Donato Bramante, who is at the same time preparing his plan for the future Basilica of St. Peter's. Now, Raphael knew that his patron would not see the ultimate outcome of Romante's designs. So here he gives them to him in pictorial illusionism. It's illusionism replete with harmonious geometries associated with Plato and Aristotle, who are framed by the triumphal arch below. Linear perspective is maintained from Alberti's canon, but here you can see more figures than Alberti would have allowed. Raphael defers to his father, who demanded that figures be shown in relief. This is particularly true in his depiction of the gods Apollo and Minerva, as though carved in stone and looming over the human figures below. Indeed, the accurate proportions that he's achieved for the philosophers are enhanced by the elongation of the sculpted figures above. He also emphasizes that this is a lively forum for debate, that Plato and Aristotle are thrashing out their views with Plato's right arm pointed to the heavens and Aristotle's hand pointed down. Hence, we see the conflict between the idealism and Plato's belief in the eternal world of forms behind the image 
in contrast to Aristotle's empiricism, that what we see around us is all that must define our knowledge of the world. Raphael also shows himself to be a master of illusionistic space by foreshortening the figure of Diogenes the Cynic splayed out on the steps, but also cunningly joining the different figure groups in the foreground and above on the steps in the middle ground. Despite the difficulties of the fresco medium, Raphael also shows his diligence in the manipulation of color as though in oils. And what this does is it achieves textural naturalism by distinguishing different materials from one another. In certain materials, Raphael uses different colors for the same fabric. Hence, he shows that this fabric is a shop fabric. It's silk, it's expensive, and therefore he associates the language of intellectual achievement with luxury. All things considered, Raphael inherited from his father the attempt to deceive the eye into thinking things are made by nature rather than art. For Renaissance artists, a more natural setting meant a more holy one, because naturalism meant you were getting closer to God's divine plan. Here's the man who commissioned the painting. Indeed, without Pope Julius II, we wouldn't have the fundamental high Renaissance images that we do. He is responsible for commissioning not only the School of Athens that decorated the papal apartments, but the new design for St. Peter's Basilica in order to renew Rome as a site of pilgrimage. And having initially commissioned Michelangelo to carve his tomb, Julius changed his mind and instead, rather more demandingly, asked this famous sculptor to paint him the ultimate frescoed ceiling. Michelangelo channeled his instincts as a sculptor into producing monumental pictorial figures, all unified within a convincing illusionistic architectural setting, one which transplanted the viewer, the worshipper, from the gritty reality of the everyday terrestrial sphere into another higher realm. And we can see the influence of Michelangelo's muscular forms from his Sistine ceiling imagery in Raphael's figure of Galatea, whose muscular physique reflects the fact that the artist was trying to achieve not necessarily a gendered ideal, but a platonic ideal. In his image of Galatea, Raphael did not rely on his study of an individual model so much as an idea that he had in his mind. And this harked back to classical Greek artists who had used multiple models and taken the best aspects of each. It also goes to show that the High Renaissance was capable of rejecting and prioritizing an ideal over the natural, of pushing naturalism to its extreme in order to achieve an image of divine perfection. It's easy to see the influence of Botticelli's Venus on Raphael's later image of Galatea. And it reminds one of the humanistic climate at the Medici Academy, in which beauty revealed the spark of the divine. But the Renaissance was not only about achieving an ideal. It also reflected the study of science. Indeed, Cosimo de' Medici was responsible for procuring a copy of Lucretius De Rerum Natura, which changed the understanding of science in the Renaissance. As an empiricist in the mold of Aristotle, Leonardo made his greatest impact on the Renaissance. In this study of five grotesque heads, Leonardo dissects the problem of an individual's physiognomy and how one's outward appearance reflects one's internal character. It's in the revival of the individual as an agent of change, that our story comes to its conclusion. Because the history of the Renaissance is, at the end of it, a revival of the value of the individual, a revival of the genre of portraiture that had died out in the medieval period. This figure of a Roman patrician from the late Republic wears the scars of a long career distinguished by public service and who relied on the preservation of their appearances in order to preserve their reputation for posterity. And here you can see the sunken jowls, the cheeks, as well as the blind eyes without pupils that indicate that this marble bust was likely based on a death mask cast at the end of this patrician's life. 
Likewise, this mummy portrait of a woman from the Fayum Basin, an oasis in Egypt at the time it was occupied by the Romans, reflects that portraiture survived into the imperial age. This is one of the earliest surviving painted portraits in existence. Here, the medium of encaustic, of hot wax painting, is used to create an accurate likeness of the woman. Thick built up areas are modeled in impasto in order to create an almost sculptural representation on a flat surface. And that's appropriate here because this form conceals the body itself within the red cartonage. So what you're looking at here is a hybrid image, one which assimilates the Egyptian tradition of mummification, but joins it to the Roman tradition of accurate likenesses. In Roman-occupied Egypt in the first century, it was believed that the soul would return to the body if an accurate likeness could be represented. The fact that the woman's name is written in Greek lettering reinforces the truly cross-cultural nature of this object, but also the relationship between likeness and one's spiritual preservation. Icons like this Byzantine icon, the famous mother of God of Vladimir, that we see likeness divorced from spirit. And what you're looking at here is not a recognizable individual. It's a type of Mary. It's a type of mother of God and Christ. This is what's known as the Virgin of Tenderness, the Eleusa type. And the crucial thing to remember is that in Byzantine art and in the culture of the medieval period, individual portraits and the agency of the individual, both the individual represented and the craftsman representing, are removed and divorced from significance. Burkhardt, who's one of the first art historians of the Renaissance, said that in the Middle Ages, both sides of human consciousness lay dreaming or half awake beneath a common veil. The veil was woven of faith, illusion, and childish prepossession through which the world and history were seen clad in strange hues. Man was conscious of himself only as a member of a race, people, party, family, or corporation, only through some general category. In Italy, this veil first melted into air. But I take issue with Burkhardt's assertion that it was in Italy that this veil was lifted. In fact, it's in Northern Europe where we see the ascent of man once again. Chancellor Rollin, who was assistant to Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, is shown without his patron saint, confessing his sins before Christ himself. This is Chancellor Rollin bringing God down to earth for his own sake. Well, what was the Northern Renaissance? And what does it have to do with the Renaissance that we've been talking about? Well, Michelangelo believed that in Flanders, they paint with a view to external exactness, without reason or art, without symmetry or proportion, and finally, without substance or vigor. For Michelangelo, the problem was there was a lack of difficulty and there was a preference for description over action. And Michelangelo's aesthetic view has a social and cultural basis in the hierarchy of mind over sense and educated viewers over ignorant ones. So Michelangelo's snobbery here reflects a bias towards works which depicted stories, narratives, actions, in which meaning was explicit rather than implicit. But Jan van Eyck's images are charged with universal symbolism. There's meaning everywhere. Here, the hand-blown glass on the left-hand side signifies the Immaculate Conception, just as Rollin's brocaded cloak trimmed with fur signifies that material wealth is indicative of spiritual health. The Northern Renaissance was not a rebirth of interest in antiquity. It was a rebirth of man. And what you can see here in the figure of Rollin is not only the return of a likeness of an individual, but the development of a new kind of three-quarter profile. And the three-quarter profile, which Raphael here inherits 
allows one to understand the internal psychology of the sitter once again. In 1528, this sitter, Castiglione, published a book in which he updated the medieval chivalric code for the modern Renaissance context. In the book, Castiglione sets out the image of an ideal courtier, of a life of sprezzatura, of effortless grace and nonchalance, because, in his words, external appearances often bear witness to what is within. The end of the Renaissance is a moot point, and it seems to extend for longer in Venice than the rest of Italy. But a study of this late work by Raphael indicates that those qualities associated with classical antiquity, balance, harmony, and order, were in decline. Here, stark lighting, chaotic gestures, and jarring colors collide to conjure a new aesthetic. Whether or not this painting intended to bring about the end of the Renaissance, the end of Raphael arguably did. Parmigianino's Madonna of the Long Neck of 15 years later reveals a very different set of values indeed. Following on from the sack of Rome by troops loyal to the Holy Roman Emperor, this painting is born of an artistic trauma. Indeed, there's a divorce between form and content. Whereas in the Renaissance, an altarpiece of the Madonna and Child would have harmonized the composition around the central figures. Here, the color is drained out. The Madonna is elongated in the extreme, her hand too, and her son appears to be sleeping on the job, or worse. Traditionally, altarpieces sought to create empathy between Christ and the worshippers, but not here. Indeed, the figure of Saint Jerome, who translated the Bible from Greek into Latin, is here shown disproportionate in the bottom right-hand corner, turning away from his scripture. This is an artistic rejection of all the Renaissance had held dear, and it came in the name of mannerism. This is the triumph of style over substance, of form over meaning, and it extended beyond the traditions of painting and sculpture into architecture as well. Here, Raphael's famous assistant, Giulia Romano, finally unpicks the order of classical antiquity. Look closely and you can see that the keystone of the arch breaks through into the pediment above. Likewise, the entablature seems to be breaking with the triglyph slipping down below. Something is not right here. Giulia Romano is deconstructing the order of classical antiquity. Balance and harmony rejected for a conscious subversion of classical tradition. As we make our way into the room of the giants, we see the weight of antiquity collapsing around us, a savage end to a titanic period.